So um, let's not get in a crisis mode. Let's get in a thoughtful planning mode. You guys are already doing the right things here. We all know a lake is the low point in the topography. Whatever happens up in the watershed is going into the lake. It's going to go into the lake. There's no question about it. Um, septic upgrades, fabulous water level issues. Is, is Highland Lake controlled by a dam? Oh. I don't know a lake in the state of Maine that doesn't have a dam on it, that has social issues around it like you read about. Because one person's media, uh, ideal level is somebody's either too high or too low. Um, version of the button. Now, jet skis, that's a social issue. And boy, that'll get things going. If you want, if you want a topic that'll get people fired up, bring that one up. Um, all right, I'm, I'm kind of getting the, uh, 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 the timing schedule here. Well, all I want to say is that if you look at the world and you realize that these freshwater issues are so huge and it's coming at us because like in our own personal lives, the things that we take for granted are always the things that come up and bite us in the back. We just don't, we just don't get, we're not prepared for it. Because the paradox of plenty is paucity of attention and that's what happens with water. We think we've got a ton of it. We don't. Okay, it's not as much as you think about. And I'll leave you with this one last thought, because I always put it on my, my, my blog site, is no water, no, no water, no civility, no civilization. And if you want to know what happens when the water suddenly gets turned off without warning, look at what happened in the Superdome in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, when we, people realized there was no water. The thin veneer of civility and humanity that surrounds us all was stripped off in a heartbeat, and it's scary. These things can be avoided. I'm thrilled that you guys are all here. This is a huge turnout. You guys ought to be giving yourselves a big pat on your back. This is important work. It's important for the economy of your town, of our state. It's in your own rational self-interest, and it's the best thing also for the planet. So. Thank you very much for inviting me here. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, I did meet her when I was up in Alaska. <laughs> um, I'm not sure what they're using in Santa Lake. Usually if it's for um, like a milfoil, it's a floor dome. Um, a disruptor. It uh, here you go. Here's some skills. It's kind of got the same active properties that Agent Orange has in it. Um, so you know, you know the problem is once you've got an invasive in your lake, you're talking management. And if, if an invasive species, whether it's a plant or an animal or whatever, once they're established, you're not getting rid of it unless you're ready to take really drastic actions. What you're ending up doing is managing the problem. And the moment you use the word manage the problem, think money. It's expensive. And if you want to see a great article, you look over what's going on over in uh, Vermont, where they have to, they've got harvesters out there. Have you guys heard about these harvesters, seen them? They're, they're, they're machines that go around, they're like rakes, and, and they, they snip under the water, about six feet under the water, they snip the weeds, and they come up on a little uh, conveyor belt into the back, and um, you as a property owner on, say, Lake St. Catherine, if you want to have your area around your house mowed, because that's what they do, they mow almost every day, the lake, um, you have to put a sticker on your dock and you pay. And at first, the Miss Valley, because here's what always happens. When the invasion comes in, people get all up in arms, they go to the town, the town goes to the state, and they, yeah, we'll do something about it. And then after about two or three years of that, the town goes, we don't really have the money. The state goes, we really don't have the money. It comes back to you. Um, so regardless of what somebody will tell you that they'll come and take care of the problem, I promise you within five to ten years, you're going to be footing the bill again. That's what happened in Vermont. So, so are you saying this herbicide is used as a prevention? Um, or it, it's already in the management phase? Um, if, it, it can be used to kill the plant. The problem is, is that um, the plant puts a lot of energy down into its roots, little rhizomes, under the, under, you know, down in the muck. 
And it can stay alive for two to three years. And, and then it comes back up. So what we as people have a tendency to try to be, oh, I want to be gentle with the leg. I don't want to put too much into it. That's why I start getting radical. It's like baloney. Kill it. I mean, take the bullet for a couple of years. And yes, if some of the fish die, some of the fish die. Because I'll tell you, if you don't get it out the first time and you just kill it dead, it's going to come back. And it's going to come back with a little bit uh, it'll, it'll evolve and it'll be more resistant and that's what they're finding is resistant strains it's not a pretty choice sir what happens to all the other plants in the lake when they do that um there can be some uh i'm i'm, tr I'm trying to go back and remember my science on this uh there can be some uh uh collateral damage but the the chemical that's used is actually fairly specific to that plant um, and it's in its receptor as opposed to like if you've got pond weed where you've got a nice leaf out there, um, it doesn't affect it as much. What happens with the, uh, the amount of chemical? What's the cost of that? Oh, the I, I, I couldn't begin to tell you. It'll be a lot of money. It'll be a lot of money. I mean, you're talking about tens of thousands of dollars, if not, you know, fifty to sixty thousand dollars. It's a lot of money. Yeah, it's not cheap. And if you look at the North American Lake Management Society's uh, magazine, which is like for all the walks around lakes and stuff, all the big four-color ads in the back and the front side, they're all for the uh, chemical manufacturers of those. They know where the money's at. Any other questions? Sir? Uh, roads, roads, uh, lake roads. Yes, sir. And the algae kills the oxygen so we don't have the fish. And we don't have clarity in the lake. Yes, sir. And nice lake. So, is there any, are there any states that are doing, uh, uh, like hopping uh, the private roads, or putting money into that sort of thing? Um, I don't know about states actually funding that. I know that there are people, you know, you've got, you're absolutely right. What happens, is, for those of you who don't know, here's the quick science of phosphorus, is it's missing an electron. So what happens is phosphorus wants to muckle onto something. So when you get a rainstorm and you get the little pieces of dirt and gravel that start to wash into the lake, phosphorus gloms on to those little pieces of dirt and whatever's going in. That's why you want to have a nice riparian buffer strip on your lake. The bu riparian buffer strip is like your skin. So, you know, 50 to 75 feet, you want to have nice growth. Plant, you know, let wildflowers grow there. I know everybody thinks, oh, you know, I want the lawn right down to the lake. That's the worst thing you can do. Just pull your skin off and see how long it takes for you to get infected. That's what happens to a lake. So you leave a nice little riparian buffer strip, which will, will strip off the phosphorus. And in terms of the roads, what's got to happen is they've got to be properly culverted and ditched so that the runoff can go to a, 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 a place where the water can percolate and the phosphorus can be stripped off as opposed to it running straight into the lake. That's the problem. Great. Thanks, guys. Yeah.